Section One of the Saga of Gunlog the Worm Tongue and Rawdon the Scald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Saga of Gunlog the Worm Tongue and Rawdon the Scald by Anonymous, translated by Eric R. Magnusson and William Morris even as ari thorkelson the learned the priest hath told it who was the man of all iceland most learned in the tales of the lands inhabiting and in lore of time agone of thorstein egelson and his kin there was a man called thorstein the son of egel the son of skallagrim the son of kvelduf the hearser of norway asgird was the mother of thorstein she was the daughter of bjornhold thorstein dwelt at burg in burgfirth he was rich of fee and a great chief a wise man meek and of measure in all wise he was not of such wondrous growth and strength as his father egil had been yet he was a right mighty man and much beloved of all the folk thorstein was goodly to look on flaxen-haired and the best eyed of men and so say men of lore that many of the kin of the mermen who are come of egil have been the goodliest folk yet for all that this kindred have differed much herein for it is said that some of them have been accounted the most ill-favoured of men but in that kin have been also many men of great prowess in many wise such as kiratan the son of olaf peacock and slaying barda and skula the son of thorstein some have been great bards too in that kin as bjorn the champion of hitdale priest einar skulason snorra sturlerson and many others now thorstein had to wife jofrid the daughter of gunnar the son of hlifar this gunnar was the best skilled in weapons and the lithest of limb of all bonder folk who have been in iceland the second was gunnar of lithend but steinthor of era was the third Jofred was eighteen winters old when Thorstein wedded her. She was a widow, for Thorod, son of Odd of Tongue, had had her to wife aforetime. Their daughter was Hungard, who was brought up at Thorstein's at Burg. Jofred was a very stirring woman. She and Thorstein had many children betwixt them, but few of them come into this tale. Skula was the eldest of their sons, Koldsvein the second, Egil the third of thorstein's dream one summer it is said a ship came from over the main into gufaros bergfin was he hight who was the master thereof a northman of kin rich in goods and somewhat stricken in years and a wise man he was withal now good man thorstein rode to the ship as it was his wont mostly to rule the market and this he did now the eastmen got housed but thorstein took the master to himself for thither he prayed to go bergfin was a few words throughout the winter but thorstein treated him well the eastman had great joy of dreams one day in springtide thorstein asked bergfin if he would ride with him up to hawkfell where at that time was the thingstead of the burg furthers for thorstein had been told that the walls of his booth had fallen in the eastman said he had good will to go so that day they rode some three together from home and the house carls of thorstein withal till they came up under hawkfell to a farmstead called foxholes there dwelt a man of small wealth called atla who was thorstein's tenant thorstein bade him come and work with them and bring with him hoe and spade this he did and when they came to the tofts of the booth they set to work all of them and did out the walls the weather was hot with sunshine that day and thorstein and the eastman grew heavy and when they had moved out the walls those two sat down within the tofts and thorstein slept and fared ill in his sleep the eastman sat beside him and let him have his dream fully out and when he awoke he was much wearied then the eastman asked him what he had dreamt as he had had such an ill time of it in his sleep thorstein said nay dreams betoken not but as they rode homeward in the evening the eastman asked him again what he had dreamt thorstein said 
if i tell thee the dream then thou shalt unriddle it to me as it verily is the eastman said he would risk it then thorstein said this was my dream for methought i was home at burg standing outside the men's door and i looked up at the house roof and on the ridge i saw a swan goodly and fair and i thought it was mine own and deemed it good beyond all things then i saw a great eagle sweep down from the mountains and fly thitherward and alight beside the swan and chuckle over her lovingly and methought the swan seemed well content thereat but i noted that the eagle was black-eyed and that on him were iron claws valiant he seemed to me after this i thought i saw another fowl come flying from the south quarter and he too came hither to burg and sat down on the house beside the swan and would fain be fond with her this also was a mighty eagle but soon i thought that the eagle first come ruffled up at the coming of the other then they fought fiercely and long and this i saw that both bled and such was the end of their play that each tumbled either way down from the house roof and there they both lay dead but the swan sat left alone drooping much and sad of semblance then i saw a fowl fly from the west that was a falcon and he sat beside the swan and made fondly towards her and they flew away both together into one and the same quarter and therewith i awoke but a dream of no mark this is he says and will in all likelihood betoken gales that they shall meet in the air from those quarters whence i deem the fowl flew the eastman spake i deem it no wise such saith he thorstein said make of the dream then what seemeth likest to thee and let me hear then said the eastman these birds are like to be fetches of men but thy wife sickens now and she will give birth to a woman child fair and lovely and dearly thou wilt love her but high-born men shall woo thy daughter coming from such quarters as the eagles seem to fly from and shall love her with overweening love and shall fight about her and both lose their lives thereby and thereafter a third man from the quarter whence came the falcon shall woo her and to that man she shall be wedded now i have unravelled thy dream and i think things will befall as i have said thorstein answered in evil and unfriendly wise is the dream interpreted nor do i deem thee fit for the work of unriddling dreams then eastman said thou shalt find how it will come to pass but thorstein estranged himself from the eastman thenceforward and he left that summer and now he is out of the tale of the birth and fostering of helga the fair this summer thorstein got ready to ride to the thing and spake to joffred his wife before he went from home so is it he said that thou art with child now but thy child shall be cast forth if thou bear a woman but nourish it if it be a man now at this time when all the land was heathen it was somewhat the want of such men as had little wealth and were likely to have many young children on their hands to have them cast forth but an evil deed it was always deemed to be and now when thorstein had said this joffred answers this is a word all unlike thee such a man as thou art and surely to a wealthy man like thee it will not seem good that this should be done thorstein answered thou knowest my mind and that no good will hap if my will be thwarted so he rode to the thing but while he was gone joffred gave birth to a woman child wondrous fair the women would fain show her to the mother she said there was little need thereof but had her shepherd thorvard called to her and spake to him thou shalt take my horse and saddle it and bring this child west to herdholt to thorgird egil's daughter and pray her to nourish it secretly so that thorstein may not know thereof for with such looks of love do i behold this child that surely i cannot bear to have it cast forth here are three marks of silver have them in reward of thy work but west their thorgird will get thee fair and food over the sea then thorvard did her bidding he rode with the child to herdholt and gave it into thorgird's hands and she had it nourished at a tenant's of hers who dwelt at friedmanstead up in havamfirth but she got fair for thorvard north in steingrimsfirth in shell creek and gave him meat outfit for his seafaring 
he went thence abroad and is now out of the story now when thornstein came home from the thing joffred told him that the child had been cast forth according to his word but that the herdsman had fled away and stolen her horse thorstein said she had done well and got himself another herdsman so six winters passed and this matter was no wise wotted of now in those days thorstein rode to herdholt being bidden there as a guest of his brother-in-law olaf peacock son of hoskuld who was then deemed to be the chief highest of worth among all men west there good cheer was made thorstein as was like to be and one day at the feast it is said that thorgerd sat in the high seat talking with her brother thorstein while olaf was talking to other men but on the bench right over against them sat three little maidens then said thorgerd how dost thou brother like the look of these three little maidens sitting straight before us right well he answers but one is by far the fairest she has all the goodliness of olaf but the whiteness and countenance of us the mere men thorgerd answered surely this is true brother wherein thou sayest that she has the fairness and countenance of us mere folk but the goodliness of olaf peacock she has not got for she is not his daughter how can that be said thorstein being thy daughter none the less she answered to say sooth kinsman quoth she this fair maiden is not my daughter but thine and therewith she told him all as it had befallen and prayed him to forgive her and his own wife that trespass thorstein said i cannot blame you two for having done this most things will fall as they are fated and well have ye covered over my folly so look i on this maiden that i deem it great good luck to have so fair a child but now what is her name helga she is called says thorgerd helga the fair says thorstein but now shalt thou make her ready to come home with me she did so and thorstein was led out with good gifts and helga rode with him to his home and was brought up there with much honor and great love from father and mother and all her kin End of section 1section two of the saga of gunlaug the worm tongue and robin the scald by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf of gunlaug worm tongue and his kin now at this time there dwelt at gilsbank up in the white water side iluga the black son of halkel the son of roskel the mother of iluga was thurid dondal daughter of gunlaug worm tongue Eluga was the next greatest chief in Bergfirth, after Thorstein Egelson. He was a man of broad lands and hardy of mood, and wont to do well to his friends. He had to wife Inga Bjorg, the daughter of Asbjorn Hordsen, from Ornolfsdale. The mother of Inga Bjorg was Thorgerd, the daughter of Midfirthskege. The children of Eluga and Inga Bjorg were many, but few of them have to do with this story hermund was one of the sons and gunlaug another both were hopeful men and at this time of ripe growth it is told of gunlaug that he was quick of growth in his early youth big and strong his hair was light red and verily goodly of fashion he was dark-eyed somewhat ugly-nosed yet of lovesome countenance thin of flank he was and broad of shoulder and the best wrought of men his whole mind very masterful eager was he from his youth up and in all wise unsparing and hardy he was a great scald but somewhat bitter in his rhyming and therefore he was called gunlaug wormtongue hermund was the best beloved of the two brothers and had the mind of a great man when gunlaug was fifteen winters old he prayed his father for goods to fare abroad withal and said he had will to travel and see the manners of other folk master eluga was slow to take the matter up and said he was unlike to be deemed good in the outlands when i can scarcely shape thee to my own liking at home on a morning but a very little afterwards it happened that eluga came out early and saw that his storehouse was opened and that some sacks of wares six of them had been brought out into the road and therewithal too some pack gear now as he wondered at this there came up a man leading four horses and who should it be but his son gunlaug and then said he 
i it was who brought out the sacks eluga asked him why he had done so he said that they should make his faring goods eluga said in no wise shalt thou thwart my will nor fare anywhere sooner than i like and in again he swung the ware sacks therewith then gunnlaug rode thence and came in the evening down to burg and goodman thorstein asked him to bide there and gunnlaug was fain of that proffer he told thorstein how things had gone betwixt him and his father and thorstein offered to let him bide there as long as he liked and for some seasons gunnlaug abode there and learned lawcraft of thorstein and all men accounted well of him now gunnlaug and helga would be always at the chess playing together and very soon each found favour with the other as came to be proven well enough afterwards they were very nigh of an age helga was so fair that men of lore say that she was the fairest woman of iceland then or since her hair was so plenteous and long that it could cover her all over and it was as fair as a band of gold nor was there any so good to choose as helga the fair in all burgfirth and far and wide elsewhere now one day as man sat in the hall at burg gunnlaug spake to thorstein one thing in law there is which thou hast not taught me and that is how to woo me a wife thorstein said that is but a small matter and therewith taught him how to go about it then said gunnlaug now shalt thou try if i have understood all i shall take thee by the hand and make as if i were wooing thy daughter helga i see no need of that said thorstein gunnlaug however groped then and there after his hand and seizing it said nay grant me this though do as thou wilt then said thorstein but be it known to all who are hereby that this shall be as if it had been unspoken nor shall any guile follow herein then gunnlaug named for himself witnesses and betrothed helga to him and asked thereafter if it would stand good thus thorstein said it was well and those who were present were mightily pleased at all this of robin and his kin there was a man called onund who dwelt in the south at mosfell he was the wealthiest of men and had a priesthood south there about the nesses he was married and his wife was called girni she was the daughter of gnup son of mold gnup who settled at grindwick in the south country their sons were robin and thorarin and eindrida they were all hopeful men but robin was in all wise the first of them he was a big man and a strong the sightliest of men and a good scald and when he was fully grown he fared between sundry lands and was well accounted of wherever he came thorod the sage the son of ivind then dwelt at ajala south in olfus with skapta his son who was then the spokesman at law in iceland the mother of skapta was ronbeig daughter of gnup the son of mold gnup and skapta and the sons of anund were sisters sons between these kinsmen was much friendship as well as kinship at this time thorfinn the son of selthorer dwelt at redmel and had seven sons who were all the hopefulest of men and of them were these thorgils eijolf and thorer and they were all the greatest men out there but these men who have now been named live all at one and the same time next to this befell those tidings the best that ever had befallen here in iceland that the whole land became christian and that all folk cast off the old faith how helga was vowed to gunnlaug and of gunnlaug's faring abroad gunnlaug wormtongue was as is aforesaid whiles at burg with thorstein whiles with his father eluga at gilsbank three winters together and was by now eighteen winters old and father and son were now much more of a mind there was a man called thorkel the black he was a housecarl of eluga and near akin to him and had been brought up in his house to him fell a heritage north at oz in waterdale and he prayed gunnlaug to go with him thither this he did and so they rode the two together to oz there they got the fee it was given up to them by those who had the keeping of it mostly because of gunnlaug's furtherance but as they rode from the north they guessed it at grimstongue at a rich bonders who dwelt there but in the morning a herdsman took gunnlaug's horse 
and it had sweated much by then he got it back then gunnlaug smote the herdsman and stunned him but the bonder would in no wise bear this and claimed a boot therefore gunnlaug offered to pay him one mark the bonder thought it too little then gunnlaug sang bade i the middling mighty to have a mark of waves flame giver of gracie's glitter this gift thou shalt make shift with if the elf son of the waters from out of purse thou lettest o waster of the worm's betty awaits thee sorrow later so the peace was made as gunnlaug bade and in such wise the two rode south now a little while after gunnlaug asked his father a second time for goods for going abroad eluga says now shalt thou have thy will for thou hast wrought thyself into something better than thou wert so eluga rode hastily from home and brought for gunnlaug half a ship which lay in gufaros from audun festagram this audun was he who would not flit abroad the sons of oswif the wise after the slaying of kjartan olafsson as is told in the story of the laxdale men which thing though betide later than this and when eluga came home gunnlaug thanked him well thorkel the black betook himself to seafaring with gunnlaug and their wares were brought to the ship but gunnlaug was at burg while they made her ready and found more cheer in talk with helga than in toiling with chapmen now one day thorstein asked gunnlaug if he would ride to his horses with him up to the long water dale gunnlaug said he would so they ride both together till they come to the mountain dairies of thorstein called thorgilstead there were stud horses of thorstein four of them together all red of hue there was one horse very goodly but little tried this horse thorstein offered to give to gunnlaug he said he was in no need of horses as he was going away from the country and so they ride to other stud horses there was a gray horse with four mares and he was the best of horses in Bergfirth. This one too Thorstein offered to give Gunnlaug, but he said, I desire these in no wise more than the others, but why dost thou not bid me what I will take? What is that? said Thorstein. Helga the fair, thy daughter, said Gunnlaug. That red is not to be settled so hastily, said Thorstein, and therewithal got on other talk. And now they ride homewards, down along long water. Then said Gunnlaug, I must needs know what thou wilt answer me about the wooing. Thorstein answers, I heed not thy vain talk, says he. Gunnlaug says, This is my whole mind, and no vain words. Thorstein says, Thou shouldst first know thine own will. Art thou not bound to fare abroad, and yet thou makest as if thou wouldst go marry? Neither art thou an even match for Helga, while thou art so unsettled and therefore this cannot so much as be looked at gunnlaug says where lookest thou for a match for thy daughter if thou wilt not give her to the son of eluga the black or who are they throughout bergfirth who are of more note than he thorstein answered i will not play at men mating says he but if thou wert such a man as he is thou wouldst not be turned away gunnlaug said to whom wilt thou give thy daughter rather than to me said thorstein hereabout are many good men to choose from thorfinn of redmel hath seven sons and all of them men of good manners gunnlaug answers neither anun nor thorfinn are men as good as my father nay thou thyself clearly fallest short of him or what hast thou to set against his strife with thorgrim the priest the son of kialak and his sons at thorsness thing where he carried all that was in debate thorstein answers i drave away steinar the son of onun sione which was deemed somewhat of a deed gunnlaug says therein thou wast holpen by thy father egil and to end all it is for few bonders to cast away my alliance said thorstein carry thy cowing away to the fellows up yonder at the mountains for down here on the maris it shall avail thee not now in the evening they come home but next morning gunnlaug rode up to gilsbank and prayed his father to ride with him a wooing out to burg eluga answered thou art an unsettled man being bound for faring abroad 
but makest now as if thou wouldst busy thyself with wife wooing and so much do i know that this is not to thorstein's mind gunnlaug answers i shall go abroad all the same nor shall i be well pleased but if thou further this so after this eluga rode with eleven men from home down to burg and thorstein greeted him well early in the morning eluga said to thorstein i would speak to thee let us go then to the top of the burg and talk together there said thorstein and so they did and gunnlaug went with them then said eluga my kinsman gunnlaug tells me that he has begun a talk with thee on his own behalf praying that he might woo thy daughter helga but now i would fain know what is like to come of this matter his kin is known to thee and our possessions from my hand shall be spared neither land nor rule over men if such things might perchance further matters thorstein said herein alone gunnlaug pleases me not that i find him an unsettled man but if he were of a mind like thine little would i hang back eluga said it will cut our friendship across if thou gainsayest me and my son an equal match thorstein answers for thy words and our friendship then helga shall be vowed but not betrothed to gunnlaug and shall bide for him three winters but gunnlaug shall go abroad and shape himself to the ways of good men but i shall be free from all these matters if he does not then come back or if his ways are not to my liking thereat they parted eluga rode home but gunnlaug rode to his ship but when they had wind at will they sailed for the main and made the northern part of norway and sailed landward along throndheim to nidaros and there they rode in the harbour and unshipped their goods end of section two Section 3 of the Saga of Gunnlaug the Wormtongue and Robin the Scald by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Of Gunnlaug in the East and the West. In those days, Earl Eric, the son of Hakon, and his brother Svein, ruled in Norway. Earl Eric abode as then at Haladir, which was left to him by his father, and a mighty lord he was skula the son of thorstein was with the earl at that time and was one of his court and well esteemed now they say that gunnlaug and audun festergram and seven of them together went up to ladir to the earl gunnlaug was so clad that he had on a gray kirtle and white long hose he had a boil on his foot by the instep and from this oozed blood and matter as he strode on in this guise he went before the earl with audun and the rest of them and greeted him well the earl knew audun and asked him tidings from iceland audun told him what there was toward then the earl asked gunnlaug who he was and gunnlaug told him his name and kin then the earl said skuli thorstein's son what manner of man is this in iceland lord says he give him good welcome for he is the son of the best man in iceland eluga the black of gilsbank and my foster brother withal the earl asked what ails thy foot icelander a boil lord said he and yet thou wentest not halt gunnlaug answers why go halt while both legs are long alike then said one of the earl's men called thorer he swaggereth hugely this icelander it would not be amiss to try him a little gunnlaug looked at him and sang a courtman there is full evil i wis a bad man and black belief let him lack then would thorir seize an axe the earl spake let it be says he to such things men should pay no heed but now icelander how old a man art thou gunnlaug answers i am eighteen winters old as now says he then says earl eric my spell is that thou shalt not live eighteen winters more gunnlaug said somewhat under his breath pray not against me but for thyself rather the earl asked thereat what didst thou say icelander gunnlaug answers what i thought well befitting that thou shouldst bid no prayers against me but pray well for thyself rather what prayers then says the earl 
that thou mightest not meet thy death after the manner of earl hakon thy father the earl turned red as blood and bade them take the rascal in haste but skula stepped up to the earl and said do this for my words lord and give this man peace so that he depart at his swiftest the earl answered at his swiftest let him be off then if he will have peace and never let him come again within my realm then skula went out with gunnlaug down to the bridges where there was an england bound ship ready to put out therein skula got for gunnlaug a berth as well as for thorkel his kinsman but gunnlaug gave his ship into audun's ward and so much of his goods as he did not take with him now sail gunnlaug and his fellows into the english main and come at autumn tide south to london bridge where they hauled ashore their ship now at that time king ethelred the son of edgar ruled over england and was a good lord this winter he sat in london but in those days there was the same tongue in england as in norway and denmark but the tongues changed when william the bastard won england for thenceforward french went current there for he was of french kin gunnlaug went presently to the king and greeted him well and worthily the king asked him from what land he came and gunnlaug told him all as it was but said he i have come to meet thee lord for that i have made a song on thee and i would that it might please thee to hearken to that song the king said it should be so and gunnlaug gave forth the song well and proudly and this is the burden thereof as god are all folk fearing the free lord king of england king of all kings and all folk to ethelred the head toe the king thanked him for the song and gave him as a song reward a scarlet cloak lined with the costliest of furs and gold embroidered down to the hem and made him his man and gunnlaug was with him all the winter and was well accounted of one day in the morning early gunnlaug met three men in a certain street and thororm was the name of their leader he was big and strong and right evil to deal with he said northman lend me some money gunnlaug answered that were ill counselled to lend one's money to unknown men he said i will pay it thee back on a named day then shall it be risked said gunnlaug and he lent him the fee withal but some time afterwards gunnlaug met the king and told him of the money lending the king answered now hast thou thriven little for this is the greatest robber and reaver deal with him in no wise but i will give thee money as much as thine was gunnlaug said then do we your men do after a sorry sort if treading sackless folk under foot we let such fellows as this deal us out of our lot nay that shall never be soon after he met thorum and claimed the fee of him he said he was not going to pay it then gunnlaug sang evil counselled art thou gold from us withholding the reddener of the edges pricking on with tricking what ye what they called me worm tongue yet a youngling nor for not so height i now is the time to show it now i will make an offer good in law says gunnlaug that thou either pay me my money or else that thou go on home with me in three nights space then laughed the viking and said before thee none have come to that to call me to home despite of all the ruin that many a man has had to take at my hands well i am ready to go thereon they parted for that time gunnlaug told the king what had befallen and he said now indeed have things taken a right hopeless turn for this man's eyes can dull any weapon but thou shalt follow my red here is a sword i will give thee with that thou shalt fight but before the battle show him another gunnlaug thanked the king well therefore now when they were ready for the home thororm asked what sort of sword it was he had gunnlaug unsheathed it and showed him but had a loop round the handle of the king's sword and slipped it over his hand the berserk looked on the sword and said i fear not that sword but now he dealt a blow on gunnlaug with his sword and cut off from him nigh all his shield gunnlaug smote in turn with the king's gift the berserk stood shieldless before him thinking he had the same weapon he had shown him 
but gunnlaug smote him his death blow then and there the king thanked him for this work and he got much fame therefore both in england and far and wide elsewhere in the spring when ships sailed from land to land gunnlaug prayed king ethelred for leave to sail some whither the king asked what he was about then gunnlaug said i would fulfil what i have given my word to do and sang this stave withal my ways must i be wending three kings walls to see yet and earls twain as i promised erewhile to land sharers neither will i wend me back the worm's bed lacking by warlord's son the wealth free for work done gift well given so be it then scald said the king and withal he gave him a ring that weighed six ounces but said he thou shalt give me thy word to come back next autumn for i will not let thee go altogether because of thy great prowess of gunnlaug in ireland thereafter gunnlaug sailed from england with chapman north to dublin in those days king sigtrig silkybeard son of king olaf kvaran and queen cormlada ruled over ireland and he had then borne sway but a little while gunnlaug went before the king and greeted him well and worthily the king received him as was meet then gunnlaug said i have made a song on thee and i would fain have silence therefore the king answered no men have before now come forward with songs for me and surely will i hearken to thine then gunnlaug brought the song whereof this is the burden swarus steed the sigtrig feed and this is therein also praise worth i can well measure in man and kings one by one lo here kvararus son gruagath the king gift of gold ring i singer know his want to bestow let the high king say heard he o'er this day song drop o measure dearer a treasure the king thanked him for the song and called his treasurer to him and said how shall the song be rewarded what hast thou will to give lord says he how will it be rewarded if i give him two ships for it said the king then said the treasurer this is too much lord other kings give in regard of songs good keepsakes fair swords or golden rings so the king gave him his own raiment of new scarlet a gold embroidered kirtle and a cloak lined with choice furs and a gold ring which weighed a mark gunnlaug thanked him well he dwelt a short time here and then went thence to the orkneys then was the lord in orkney earl sigurd the son of hlodver he was friendly to icelanders now gunnlaug greeted the earl well and said he had a song to bring him the earl said he would listen thereto since he was of such great kin in iceland then gunnlaug brought the song it was a shorter lay and well done the earl gave him for lay reward a broad axe all inlaid with silver and bade him abide with him gunnlaug thanked him both for his gift and his offer but said he was bound east for sweden and thereafter he went on board ship with chapman who sailed to norway in the autumn they came east to king's cliff thorkel his kinsman being with him all the time from king's cliff they got a guide up to west gotland and came upon a cheaping stead called skarir there ruled an earl called sigurd a man stricken in years gunnlaug went before him and told him he had made a song on him the earl gave a willing ear here too and gunnlaug brought the song which was a shorter lay the earl thanked him and rewarded the song well and bade him abide there that winter earl sigurd had a great yule feast in the winter and on yule eve came thither men sent from earl eric of norway twelve of them together and brought gifts to earl sigurd the earl made them good cheer and bade them sit by gunnlaug through the yuletide and there was great mirth at the drinks now the gothlanders said that no earl was greater or of more fame than earl sigurd but the norwegians thought that earl eric was by far the foremost of the two 
hereon would they bandy words till they both took gunnlaug to be umpire in the matter then he sang this stave tell ye staves of spear din how on sleek side sea horse off this earl hath proven over topping billows but eric victory's ash tree oft hath seen in the seas more of high blue billows before the bows are roaring both sides were content with his finding but the norwegians the best but after yuletide those messengers left with gifts of goodly things which earl sigurd sent to earl eric now they told earl eric of gunnlaug's finding the earl thought that he had shown upright dealing and friendship to him herein and let out some words saying that gunnlaug should have good peace throughout his land what the earl had said came thereafter to the ears of gunnlaug but now earl sigurd gave gunnlaug a guide east to tenth land in sweden as he had asked end of section three section four of the saga of gunnlaug the worm tongue and raven the scald by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf of the quarrel between gunnlaug and raven before the swedish king in those days king olaf the swede son of king eric the victorious and sigrid the high counseled daughter of skogel tosti ruled over sweden he was a mighty king and renowned and full fain of fame gunnlaug came to upsala towards the time of the thing of the swedes in springtide and when he got to see the king he greeted him the king took his greeting well and asked who he was he said he was an iceland man then the king called out raven says he what man is he in iceland then one stood up from the lower bench a big man and a stalwart and stepped up before the king and spake lord says he he is of good kin and himself the most stalwart of men let him go then and sit beside thee said the king then gunnlaug said i have a song to set forth before thee king and i would fain have peace while thou hearkenest thereto go ye first and sit ye down says the king for there is no leisure now to sit listening to songs so they did as he bade them now gunnlaug and raven fell a-talking together and each told each of his travels raven said that he had gone the summer before from iceland to norway and had come east to sweden in the fore part of the winter they soon got friendly together but one day when the thing was over they both went before the king gunnlaug and raven then spake gunnlaug now lord i would that thou shouldst hear the song that i may do now said the king my song too will i set forth now said raven thou mayest do so said the king then gunnlaug said i will set forth mine first if thou wilt have it so king nay said raven it behoveth me to be first lord for i myself came first to thee whereto came our fathers forth so that my father was the little boat towed behind whereto but nowhere said gunnlaug and in likewise shall it be with us raven answered let us be courteous enough not to make this a matter of bandying of words let the king rule here the king said let gunnlaug set forth his song first for he will not be at peace till he has his will then gunnlaug set forth the song which he had made to king olaf and when it was at an end the king spake raven says he how is the song done right well he answered it is a song full of big words and little beauty a somewhat rugged song as is gunnlaug's own mood well raven thy song said the king raven gave it forth and when it was done the king said how was this song made gunnlaug well it is lord he said this is a pretty song as is raven himself to behold and delicate of countenance but why didst thou make a short song on the king raven didst thou perchance deem him unworthy of a long one raven answered let us not talk longer on this matters will be taken up again though it be later and thereat they parted soon after raven became a man of king olaf's and asked him leave to go away 
this the king granted him and when robin was ready to go he spake to gunnlaug and said now shall our friendship be ended for that thou must needs shame me here before great men but in time to come i shall cast on thee no less shame than thou hadst will to cast on me here gunnlaug answers thy threats grieve me not nowhere are we likely to come where i shall be thought less worthy than thou king olaf gave to robin good gifts at parting and thereafter how robin came home to iceland and asked for helga to wife now this spring robin came from the east to thrandheim and fitted out his ship and sailed in the summer to iceland he brought his ship to liravog below the heath and his friends and kinsmen were right fain of him that winter he was at home with his father but the summer after he met at the all thing his kinsman skapta the lawman then said robin to him thine aid would i have to go a wooing to thorstein egelson to bid helga his daughter skapta answered but is she not already vowed to gunnlaug wormtongue said robin is not the appointed time of waiting between them passed by and far too wanton is he withal that he should hold or heed it aught let us then do as thou wouldst said skapta thereafter they went with many men to the booth of thorstein egelson and he greeted them well then skapta spoke robin my kinsman is minded to woo thy daughter helga thou knowest well his blood his wealth and his good manners his many mighty kinsmen and friends thorstein said she is already the vowed maiden of gunnlaug and with him shall i hold all words spoken skapta said are not the three winters worn now that were named between you yes said thorstein but the summer is not yet worn and he may still come out this summer then skapta said but if he cometh not this summer what hope may we have of the matter then thorstein answered we are like to come here next summer and then may we see what may wisely be done but it will not do to speak hereof longer at this time thereon they parted and men rode home from the all thing but this talk of robin's wooing of helga was not hidden that summer gunnlaug came not out the next summer at the all thing skapta and his folk pushed the wooing eagerly and said that thorstein was free as to all matters with gunnlaug thorstein answered i have few daughters to see to and fain am i that they should not be the cause of strife to any man now i will first see eluga the black and so he did and when they met he said to eluga dost thou not think that i am free from all troth with thy son gunnlaug eluga said surely if thou willest it little can i say herein as i do not know clearly what gunnlaug is about then thorstein went to skapta and a bargain was struck that the wedding should be at burg about winter nights if gunnlaug did not come out that summer but that thorstein should be free from all troth with robin if gunnlaug should come and fetch his bride after this men ride home from the thing and gunnlaug's coming was long drawn out but helga thought evilly on all these reds of how gunnlaug must needs abide away from iceland now it is to be told of gunnlaug that he went from sweden the same summer that robin went to iceland and good gifts he had from king olaf at parting king ethelred welcomed gunnlaug worthily and that winter he was with the king and was held in great honor in those days Nut the great son of svein ruled denmark and had new taken his father's heritage and he vowed ever to wage war on england for that his father had won a great realm there before he died west in that same land and at that time there was a great army of danish men west there whose chief was hemming the son of earl strut harald the brother to earl sigvalda and he held for king Nut the land that svein had won now in the spring gunnlaug asked the king for leave to go away but he said it ill beseems that thou my man should go away now when all bodes such mighty war in the land gunnlaug said thou shalt rule lord but give me leave next summer to depart if the danes come not the king answered then we shall see now this summer went by and the next winter but no danes came and after midsummer gunnlaug got his leave to depart from the king and went thence east to norway and found earl eric in thrandheim at hladir 
and the earl greeted him well and bade him abide with him gunnlaug thanked him for his offer but he said he would first go out to iceland to look to his promised maiden the earl said now all ships bound for iceland have sailed then said one of the court here lay yesterday halfred trublet scald out of tinder ogdodness the earl answered that may well be he sailed hence five nights ago then earl eric had gunnlaug road put to halfred who greeted him with joy and forthwith a fair wind bore them from land and they were right merry this was late in the summer but now halfred said to gunnlaug hast thou heard how Ravan, the son of anund is wooing helga the fair gunnlaug said he had heard thereof but dimly halfred tells him all he knew of it and therewith too that it was the talk of many men that Ravan was in no wise less brave a man than gunnlaug then gunnlaug sang this stave light the weather wafteth but if this east wind drifted week long wild upon us little were i recking more this word i mind of me with Ravan mated then gain for me the gold foe of days to make me gray-haired then halfred said well fellow mayest thou fare better in thy strife with Ravan than i did in mine i brought my ship some winters ago into liravog and had to pay half a mark in silver to a housecarl of Ravan's, but i held it back from him so Ravan rode at us with sixty men and cut the moorings of the ship and she was driven up on the shallows and we were bound for a wreck then i had to give self-doom to Ravan, and a whole mark i had to pay and that is the tale of my dealings with him then they two talked together alone of helga the fair and gunnlaug praised her much for her goodliness and gunnlaug sang he who brand of battle beareth over weary never love shall let him hold the linen folded for we when we were younger in many a way were playing on the outward nesses from golden land outstanding well sung said halfred end of section four section five of the saga of gunnlaug the worm tongue and Ravan the scald by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf of gunnlaug's landing and how he found helga wedded to Ravan. they made land north by fox plain in hraunhaven half a month before winter and there unshipped their goods now there was a man called thord a bonder son of the plain there he fell to wrestling with the chapmen and they mostly got worsted at his hands then a wrestling was settled between him and gunnlaug the night before thord made vows to thor for the victory but the next day when they met they fell to wrestling then gunnlaug tripped both feet from under thord and gave him a great fall but the foot that gunnlaug stood on was put out of joint and gunnlaug fell together with thord then said thord may that other things go no better for thee what then said gunnlaug thy dealings with Ravan, if he wed helga the fair at winter nights i was anigh at the thing when that was settled last summer gunnlaug answered not thereto now the foot was swathed and put into joint again and it swelled mightily but he and halfred ride twelve in company till they come to gilsbank in bergfirth the very saturday night when folk sat at the wedding at berg Iluga was fain of his son Gunnlaug and his fellows, but Gunnlaug said he would ride then and there down to Berg. Iluga said it was not wise to do so, and to all but Gunnlaug that seemed good, but Gunnlaug was then unfit to walk because of his foot, though he would not let that be seen. Therefore there was no faring to Berg. On the morrow, Alfred rode to Hredawater in North Waterdale, where Galta, his brother, and a brisk man managed their matters of the winter wedding at Skani, and how gunnlaug gave the king's cloak to helga tells the tale of Ravan that he sat at his wedding's feast at berg and it was the talk of most men that the bride was but drooping for true is the saw that saith 
long we remember what youth gained us and even so it was with her now but this new thing befell at the feast that hungerd the daughter of thorod and joffred was wooed by a man named sverting the son of hofer bjorn the son of molgna and the wedding was to come off that winter after yule at skani where dwelt thorkel the kinsman of hungerd and son of torn valbrunson and the mother of torn was thorada the sister of odd of the tongue now robin went home to mosfell with helga his wife when they had been there a little while one morning early before they rose up helga was awake but robin slept and fared ill in his sleep and when he awoke helga asked him what he had dreamt then robin sang in thine arms so dreamed i hewn was i gold island bride in blood i bled there bed of thine was reddened never more than mightst thou mead bowls poor speedy bind my gashes bloody lind leek bow thou likest it helga spake never shall i weep therefore quoth she ye have evilly beguiled me and gunnlaug has surely come out and therewith she wept much but a little after gunnlaug's coming was bruited about and helga became so hard with robin that he could not keep her at home at mosfell so that back they had to go to burg and robin got small share of her company now men get ready for the winter wedding thorkel of skane bade eluga the black and his sons but when master eluga got ready gunnlaug sat in the hall and stirred not to go eluga went up to him and said why dost thou not get ready kinsman gunnlaug answered i have no mind to go says eluga nay but certes thou shalt go kinsman says he and cast thou not grief over thee by yearning for one woman make as if thou knewest not of it for women thou wilt never lack now gunnlaug did as his father bade him so they came to the wedding and eluga and his sons were set down in the high seat but thorstein egelson and robin his son-in-law and the bridegroom's following were set in the other high seat over against eluga the women sat on the dais and helga the fair sat next to the bride off she turned her eyes on gunnlaug thereby proving the saw eyes will be ray if maid love man gunnlaug was well arrayed and had on him that goodly raiment that king sigtrig had given him and now he was thought far above all other men because of many things both strength and goodliness and growth there was little mirth among the folk at this wedding but on the day when all men were making ready to go away the women stood up and got ready to go home then went gunnlaug to talk to helga and long they talked together but gunnlaug sang light-hearted live the worm tongue all day long no longer in mountain home since helga had name of wife of robin not foresaw thy father hardener white of fight thaw what my word should come to the maid to gold was wedded and again he sang worst reward i owe them father thine o wine may and mother that they made thee so fair beneath thy maid gear for thou sweet field of sea flame all joy has slain within me lo here take it loveliest air made of lord and lady and therewith gunnlaug gave helga the cloak ethelred's gift which was the fairest of things and she thanked him well for the gift then gunnlaug went out and by that time riding horses had been brought home and saddled and among them were many very good ones and they were all tied up in the road gunnlaug leaps on to a horse and rides a hand gallop along the home field up to a place where robin happened to stand just before him and robin had to draw out of his way then gunnlaug said no need to slink aback robin for i threaten thee not as at this time 
but thou knowest forsooth what thou hast earned robin answered and sang god of wound flamed glitter glorier of fight goddess must we fall a-fighting for fairest kirtle bearer death staffs many such like fair as she is are there in south lands o'er the sea floods sooth saith he who knoweth maybe there are many such but they do not seem so to me said gunnlaug therewith illuga and thorstein ran up to them and would not have them fight then gunnlaug sang the fair hued golden goddess for gold to ravan sold they ravan my match as men say while the mighty isle king ethelred in england from eastward way delayed me wherefore to gold waster waneth tongue speech hunger hereafter both rode home and all was quiet and tidingless that winter through but robin had not of helga's fellowship after her meeting with gunnlaug of the home gang at the althing now in summer men ride a very many to the althing eluga the black and his sons with him gunnlaug and hermund thorstein egelson and kolsvein his son anund of mosfell and his sons all and sverting haverbjorn's son skapta yet held the spokesmanship at law one day at the thing as men went thronging to the hill of laws and when the matters of law were done there then gunnlaug craved silence and said is robin the son of anund here he said he was then spake gunnlaug thou well knowest that thou hast got to wife my avowed bride and thus hast thou made thyself my foe now for this i bid thee to home here at the thing in the home of the axe water when three nights are gone by robin answers this is well bidden as was to be looked for of thee and for this i am ready whenever thou willest it now the kin of each deemed this a very ill thing but at that time it was lawful for him who thought himself wronged by another to call him to fight on the holm so when three knights had gone by they got ready for the home gang and eluga the black followed his son thither with a great following but skapta the lawman followed robin and his father and the other kinsmen of his now before gunnlaug went upon the holm he sang out to isle o field field dight am i to high me give o god thy singer with glaive to end the striving here shall i the head cleave of helga's love's devourer at last my bright sword bringeth sundering of head and body then robin answered and sang thou singer knowest not surely which of us twain shall gain it with edge for leg swath eager here are the wound sighs bare now in whatso wise we wound us the tidings from the thing here and fame of thane's fair doings the fair young maid shall hear it hermung held the shield for his brother gunnlaug but sverting half your bjorn's son was robin's shield bearer whoso would be wounded was to ransom himself from the home with three marks of silver now robin's part it was to deal the first blow as he was the challenged man he hewed at the upper part of gunnlaug's shield and the sword brake asunder just beneath the hilt with so great might he smote but the point of the sword flew up from the shield and struck gunnlaug's cheek whereby he got just grazed with that their fathers ran in between them and many other men now said gunnlaug i call robin overcome as he is weaponless but i say thou art vanquished since thou art wounded said robin now gunnlaug was nigh mad and very wrathful and said it was not tried out yet eluga his father said that they should try no more for that time gunnlaug said 
beyond all things i desire that i might in such wise meet robin again that thou father were not an eye to part us and thereat they parted for that time and all men went back to their booths but on the second day after this it was made law in the law court that henceforth all home gangs should be forbidden and this was done by the counsel of all the wisest men that were at the thing and there indeed were all the men of most counsel in all the land and this was the last home gang fought in iceland this wherein gunnlaug and robin fought but this thing was the third most thronged thing that had been held in iceland the first was after njal's burning the second after the heath slaughters now one morning as the brothers hermund and gunnlaug went to axe water to wash on the other side went many women towards the river and in that company was helga the fair then said hermund dost thou see thy friend helga there on the other side of the river surely i see her said gunnlaug and withal he sang born was she for men's bickering sore bale hath wrought the war stemmy and i yearned ever madly to hold that oak tree golden to me then me destroyer of swan meads flame unneedful this looking on the dark-eyed this golden lands beholding therewith they crossed the river and helga and gunnlaug spake a while together and as the brothers crossed the river eastward back again helga stood and gazed long after gunnlaug then gunnlaug looked back and sang moon of linen and lapped one leek sea bearing goddess hawk keen out of heaven shone all bright upon me but that eyelids moonbeam of golden necklace goddess her hath all undoing wrought and made me not of end of section five section six of the saga of gunnlaug the worm tongue and robin the scald by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf how gunnlaug and robin agreed to go east to norway to try the matter again now after these things were gone by men rode home from the thing and gunnlaug dwelt at home at gilsbank on a morning when he awoke all men had risen up but he alone still lay abed he lay in a shut bed behind the sheets now into the hall came twelve men all fully armed and who should be there but robin anun's son gunnlaug sprang up forthwith and got to his weapons but robin spake thou art in risk of no hurt this time quoth he but my errand hither is what thou shalt now hear thou didst call me to a home gang last summer at the althing and thou didst not deem matters to be fairly tried therein now i will offer thee this that we both fare away from iceland and go abroad next summer and go on home in norway for there our kinsmen are not like to stand in our way gunnlaug answered hail to thy words stoutest of men this thine offer i take gladly and here robin mayest thou have cheer as good as thou mayest desire it is well offered said robin but this time we shall first have to ride away thereon they parted now the kinsmen of both sore misliked them of this but could in no wise undo it because of the wrath of gunnlaug and robin and after all that must be tied that drew towards now it is to be said of robin that he fitted out his ship in Lyravog. two men are named that went with him sister sons of his father anund one hight grim the other olaf doughty men both all the kinsmen of robin thought it great scathe when he went away but he said he had challenged gunnlaug to the home gang because he could have no joy soever of helga and he said withal that one must fall before the other so robin put to sea when he had wind at will and brought his ship to thrandheim and was there that winter and heard naught of gunnlaug that winter through 
there lie abode him the summer following and still another winter was he in throndheim at a place called liffanger gunlaug wormtongue took ship with halfred trubulus scald in the north at the plain they were very late ready for sea they sailed into the main when they had a fair wind and made orkney a little before winter earl sigurd lodverson was still lord over the isles and gunlaug went to him and abode there that winter and the earl held him of much account in the spring the earl would go on warfare and gunlaug made ready to go with him and that summer they harried wide about the south isles and scotland's firths and had many fights and gunlaug always showed himself the bravest and doughtiest of fellows and the hardiest of men wherever they came earl sigurd went back home early in the summer but gunlaug took ship with chapman sailing for norway and he and earl sigurd parted in great friendship gunlaug fared north to throndheim to Haladjer, to see earl eric and dwelt there through the early winter the earl welcomed him gladly and made offer to gunlaug to stay with him and gunlaug agreed thereto the earl had heard already how all had befallen between gunlaug and robin and he told gunlaug that he laid ban on their fighting within his realm gunlaug said the earl should be free to have his will herein so gunlaug abode there the winter through ever heavy of mood how the two foes met and fought at dingness but on a day in spring gunlaug was walking abroad and his kinsman thorkel with him they walked away from the town till on the meads before them they saw a ring of men and in that ring were two men with weapons fencing but one was named raven the other gunlaug while they who stood by said the icelanders smote light and were slow to remember their words gunlaug saw the great mocking hereunder and much jeering was brought into the play and withal he went away silent so a little while after he said to the earl that he had no mind to bear any longer the jeers and mocks of his courtiers about his dealings with raven and therewith he prayed the earl to give him a guide to liffanger now before this the earl had been told that raven had left liffanger and gone east to sweden therefore he granted gunlaug leave to go and gave him two guides for the journey now gunlaug went from haladjer with six men to liffanger and on the morning of the very day whereas gunlaug came in in the evening raven had left liffanger with four men thence gunlaug went to veradale and came always in the evening to where raven had been the night before so gunlaug went on till he came to the uppermost farm in the valley called sula wherefrom had raven fared in the morning there he stayed not his journey but kept on his way through the night then in the morning at sunrise they saw one another raven had got to a place where were two waters and between them flat meads and they are called gleipnas meads but in one water stretched a little ness called dingness there on the ness raven and his fellows five together took their stand with raven were his kinsmen grim and olaf now when they met gunlaug said it is well that we have found one another raven said he had not to quarrel with therein but now says he thou mayest choose as thou wilt either that we fight alone together or that we fight all of us man to man gunlaug said that either way seemed good to him then spake raven's kinsmen grim and olaf and said that they would little like to stand by and look on the fight and in likewise spake thorkel the black the kinsman of gunlaug then said gunlaug to the earl's guides ye shall sit by and aid neither side and be here to tell of our meeting and so they did so they set on and fought dauntlessly all of them grim and olaf went both against gunlaug alone and so closed their dealings with him that gunlaug slew them both and got no wound this proves thord kolbein's son in a song that he made on gunlaug the worm tongue grim and olaf great hearts in gondul's din with thin sword first did gunlaug fell there ere at raven fared he bold with blood be drifted bane of three the thane was warlord of the wave-horse 
wrought for menfolk's slaughter meanwhile robin and thorkel the black gunlug's kinsman fought until thorkel fell before robin and lost his life and so at last all their fellowship fell then they two alone fought together with fierce onsets and mighty strokes which they dealt each the other falling on furiously without stop or stay gunlaug had the sword ethelred's gift and that was the best of weapons at last gunlaug dealt a mighty blow at robin and cut his leg from under him but none the more did robin fall but swung round up to a tree stem whereat he steadied the stump then said gunlaug now thou art no more meet for battle nor will i fight with thee any longer a maimed man robin answered so it is said he that my lot is now all the worser lot but it were well with me yet might i but drink somewhat gunlaug said beray me not if i bring thee water in my helm i will not beray thee said robin then went gunlaug to a brook and fetched water in his helm and brought it to robin but robin stretched forth his left hand to take it but with his right hand drave his sword into gunlaug's head and that was a mighty great wound then gunlaug said evilly hast thou beguiled me and done traitorously wherein i trusted thee robin answers thou sayest sooth but this brought me to it that i begrudge thee to lie in the bosom of helga the fair thereat they fought on recking of naught but the end of it was that gunlaug overcame robin and there robin lost his life then the earl's guides came forward and bound the head wound of gunlaug and in meanwhile he sat and sang o oh, thou sword storm stirrer robin stem of battle famous fared against me fiercely in the spear din many a flight of metal was borne on me this morning by the spear walls builder ring bearer on hardingness after that they buried the dead and got gunlaug onto his horse thereafter and brought him right down to lifanger there he lay three nights and got all his rites of a priest and died thereafter and was buried at the church there all the men thought it great scathe of both these men gunlaug and robin amid such deeds as they died end of section six section seven of the saga of gunlaug the worm tongue and robin the scald by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the news of the fight brought to iceland now this summer before these tidings were brought out hither to iceland eluga the black being at home at gilsbank dreamed a dream he thought that gunlaug came to him in his sleep all bloody and he sang in the dream this stave before him and eluga remembered the song when he woke and sang it before others knew i of the hewing of robin's hilt fin steel fish burny shearing sword edge sharp clave leg of robin of warm wounds drank the eagle when the war rod slender cleaver of the corpses clave the head of gunlaug this portent befell south at mosfell the self-same night that anund dreamed how robin came to him covered all over with blood and sang red is the sword but i now am undone by sword odin gainst shields beyond the sea flood the rune of shields was wielded methinks the blood foul blood stained in blood o'er men's heads stood there the wounder and yet wound eager trod over wounded bodies now the second summer after this eluga the black spoke at the althing from the hill of laws and said 
wherewith wilt thou make atonement to me for my son who robin thy son beguiled in his troth anund answers be it far from me to atone for him so sorely as their meeting hath wounded me yet will i not ask atonement of thee for my son then shall my wrath come home to some of thy kin says eluga and withal after the thing was eluga at most times very sad tells the tale how this autumn eluga rode from gelsbank with thirty men and came to mosfell early in the morning then anund got into the church with his sons and took sanctuary but eluga caught two of his kin one called bjorn the other called thorgrim and had bjorn slain but the feet smitten from thorgrim and thereafter eluga rode home and there was no writing of this for anund hermund eluga's son had little joy after the death of gunnlaug his brother and deemed he was none the more avenged even though this had been wrought now there was a man called Robin, brother's son to Anund of Mosfell. He was a great seafarer and had a ship that lay up in Ramfirth. And in the spring, Hermund Ilugason rode from home alone north over Holt Beacon Heath, even to Ramfirth, and out as far as Board, heir to the ship of the Chapmen. The Chapmen were then nearly ready for sea. Robin, the shipmaster, was on shore, and many men with him hermund rode up to him and thrust him through with his spear and rode away forthwith but all robin's men were bewildered at seeing hermund no atonement came for this slaying and therewith ended the dealings of eluga the black and anund of mosfell the death of helga the fair as time went on thorstein egelson married his daughter helga to a man called thorkel son of halkel who lived west in hrundale Helga went to his house with him, but loved him little, for she could not cease to think of Gunnlaug, though he be dead. Yet was Thorkell a doughty man, and wealthy of goods, and a good scald. They had children together not a few. One of them was called Thorarin, another Thorstein, and yet more they had. But Helga's chief joy was to pluck at the threads of that cloak, Gunnlaug's gift, and she would be ever gazing at it but on a time there came a great sickness to the house of thorkell and helga and many were bedridden for a long time helga also fell sick and yet she could not keep a bed so one saturday evening helga sat in the fire hall and leaned her head upon her husband's knees and had the cloak gunnlaug's gift sent for and when the cloak came to her she sat up and plucked at it and gazed thereon a while and then sank back upon her husband's bosom and was dead then thorkell sang this dead in my arms she droopeth my dear one gold rings bearer for god hath changed the life days of this lady of the linen weary pain hath pined her but unto me the seeker of hoard of fishes highway abiding here is wearier helga was buried in the church there but thorkell dwelt yet at rundale but a great matter seemed the death of helga to all as was to be looked for and here endeth the story end of section seven End of the saga of Gunnlaug the Wormtongue and Robin the Scald by Anonymous. Translated by Erica Magnusson and William Morris.